very generous remarks. Uh, I've written this to come in just under half an hour because we have a lot of stuff to do. Uh, so uh, let me get started on it, and then there will be some other things that will go on as well. Uh, and I'm going to read it because it goes more smoothly that way. The history of the Soviet Union during the time of Joseph Stalin's leadership has been the subject of lies, forgeries, falsifications, and slanders since the 1920s. Since the end of the Soviet Union in 1991, a great many primary documents from formerly closed Soviet archives have been published. This evidence permits us to see that the historical account of the Stalin period that we have all been taught, and that has become general knowledge, that account is utterly false, a monstrous anti-communist falsification. Today, all post-Soviet states, plus those of the former Soviet bloc, are committed to strongly anti-communist and especially anti-Stalin versions of history. This anti-Stalinism is necessary to justify their super-exploitative policies towards their own working classes and the history of racism, fascism, Nazi collaboration, and mass murder by the so-called nationalists whom they uphold as heroes. This is understandable. Why shouldn't capitalists, fascists, racists, crypto-Nazis, and right-wing nationalists lie about the history of the communist movement? Logical. But this demonized and completely false version of the Stalin years has been uncritically swallowed by the left as well. I should put left in quotation marks, but you know. This prevents us from understanding what really happened in the Soviet Union, and so from learning from the Soviet experience, positive and negative. Today I'm going to report briefly on recent research of my own on eight issues in Soviet history of the 1930s, the Stalin period. They illustrate how false the prevailing construction of the Stalin period of Soviet history is. Others, especially in Russia, are also working along similar lines. And I call this talk the continuing revolution in Stalin-era Soviet history. One, so eight points. First point, Stalin and democracy. In 2005, I published a long two-part article entitled Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform in Cultural Logic. In it, I brought to the English-speaking public some recent research by Russian historians, principally that of Yuri Shukov, a fellow of the Russian Academy of Sciences, who had access to secret Soviet archives for 15 years. Zhukov documents Stalin's struggle to get the Soviet Communist Party out of the job of running the country in order to turn that job over to the Soviets. Stalin's goal was finally embodied in the 1936 Soviet Constitution, which called for equal, universal, secret, and, this is a central issue, contested elections. Stalin and his supporters encountered a great deal of overt resistance within the party leadership and central committee. Contested elections were scheduled for December 1937, but resistance to them was so strong within the central committee that the provision for contested elections was canceled at virtually the last minute on October 11, 1937. They were never to be held. It appears that Stalin tried to revive this democratic movement again in the 40s, but was unsuccessful. There is some evidence that Lodrenti Beria wanted to continue that effort after Stalin's death, and that this was a prime reason he was murdered in 1953 by the other members of the Soviet leadership. Two, Khrushchev lied. In terms of its practical impact on world history, Khrushchev's secret speech is by is the most influential speech of the 20th century and possibly of all time. In it, Khrushchev painted Stalin as a bloodthirsty tyrant, guilty of a reign of terror lasting more than two decades. As a direct result of this speech, about one half of all the members of the communist parties in the non-communist bloc quit their parties within two years. After the 22nd Party Congress of 1961, where Khrushchev and his men attacked Stalin with even more venom, Many Soviet historians elaborated Khrushchev's lies. These falsehoods were repeated by Cold War anti-communists like Robert Conquest. They also entered left discourse, not only through the work of Trotskyists and anarchists, but through those of pro-Moscow communists, who, of course, had to accept Khrushchev's version. During 2005 and 2000. In 2005, I researched and wrote the book Khrushchev Lie. Its long subtitle reads, quote, The evidence that every revelation of Stalin's and various crimes indicated Khrushchev's infamous secret speech to the 20th Party Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union on February 25th, 1956, is provably false. In my book, I identify 61 accusations that Khrushchev made against either Stalin or, in a few cases, Beria. 
I then studied each one of them in the light of evidence available from former Soviet archives. To my own surprise, I found that 60 of the 61 accusations are provably demonstrably false. About the other one, it was a minor one, it's not clear one way or the other. Few people today read this speech, full of references to people and events, few of which non-specialists have ever heard of. But everybody has heard about it. Everyone assumes that Khrushchev really did reveal crimes of Stalin. The fact that Khrushchev could falsify everything and get away with it for over 50 years suggests that we should look carefully at other supposed crimes of Stalin and of the Soviet Union during his time. Three, the murder of Sergei Kirov. At about 4.30 p.m. on December 1st, 1934, Leonid Vasilievich Nikolaev, an unemployed party member, shot Sergei Milanovich Kirov, first secretary of the Bolshevik party in Leningrad, in the back of the skull. Nikolaev then tried to shoot himself in the head, but missed and fainted. At first, he seems to have claimed that he had killed Kirov on his own. Before a week was out, Nikolaev had admitted that he was a part of a conspiracy by a clandestine group of party members opposed to Joseph Stalin and favoring Grigory Zinoviev, Leningrad first secretary before Kirov. Uh, interrogations of those persons, Nik whom Nikolaev had named, and then of the persons named by those men, led to a number of partial and a few fuller confessions. Three weeks after the murder, 14 men were indicted for conspiracy to kill Kirov. They were tried on December 28th to 29th, convicted and executed immediately. The larger significance of the Kirov murder unfolded gradually during the next three years. The threads that bound the Kirov conspirators to Zinoviev and Kamenev led to the three Moscow show trials, so-called, of 1936, 37, and 38, and to the trial, trial of the military commanders known as the Tukhachevsky Affair of 1937. In his secret speech, Khrushchev cast doubt on the official version of the Kirov assassination. Khrushchev's men tried hard to find any evidence they could to prove that Stalin had been behind Kirov's murder. Unable to do so, they settled at length for a story that Nikolaev had acted on his own. However, the version that Stalin had caused Kirov to be killed continued to circulate, becoming widely believed both inside and outside the Soviet Union. Since 1990, the view officially accepted in Russia has been that Nikolaev acted alone, and that Stalin used Nikolaev's murder to frame former or putative rivals forcing them to admit the crimes they had never committed, and then executing them and ultimately many thousands more. My goal has been to solve the Kirov murder case. I review all the evidence as objectively as possible with appropriate skepticism, and without any preconceived conclusion in mind. The main conclusion of my study is that Nikolaev was not a lone gunman at all. The Soviet investigators and prosecution got it right in December 1934. A clandestine Zinoviovite conspiratorial organization, of which Nikolaev was a member, killed Kirov. Implications. Khrushchev aimed to debunk the then-canonical narrative of Soviet history during the 1930s and create a new one out of whole cloth, one in which Stalin was the criminal who had framed and executed a great many innocent party members. Khrushchev realized that the complete rewriting of Soviet history he wanted necessitated a reversal of verdicts in the Kirov case. And the reverse is also true. To reinstate the original verdict against the defendants of the December 34 Kirov trial implies that the defendants of the conspiracy cases that followed it, the Moscow Center trial of January 1935, the Kremlin affair of 1935, the three Moscow show trials of 36, 37, and 38, and the Tukhachevsky affair trial of June 37, might well have been guilty, since the testimony in all three show trials and in the Tukhachevsky affair trial implicated Leon Trotsky, it raised the possibility that Trotsky might have been guilty, too. Likewise, it suggests that other party leaders tried and executed in non-public trials might be guilty as well. Briefly put, the whole post-Khrushchev paradigm of Soviet history that I have called for short the anti-Stalin paradigm is in play in the Kirov murder. The Kirov murder case is one of a number of hot-button issues in Soviet history. Others include the Moscow trials, the Azhovshina of 1937-38, also known in Cold War terminology as the Great Terror, and the Kita Khrushchev's secret speech. All of these events are crucially linked to the Kirov affair. The Kirov murder is fundamental to our understanding of both elite and mass politics of the 1930s in the Soviet Union, and in fact to the fate of socialism itself. Four, Timothy Snyder, Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin, New York Basic Books, 2010. Snyder, a full professor of Eastern European history at Yale, has written two dozen articles for leading intellectual journals such as the New York Review of Books, 
Now it's more because he's being interviewed and writing all over the place in New York Review, books in New York Times and other places about the Ukrainian situation, right? In 2010, he published a book called Bloodlands. This book is by far the most successful attempt to date to equate Stalin with Hitler, the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany. It has garnered rave reviews in literally dozens of newspapers and journals, received many prizes for historiography, and been translated into 26 languages and still counting. Snyder has little to say about the Nazis, in fact. His main target is Stalin, Soviet policy, and communists generally. His broader claim is that the Soviets killed 6 to 9 million innocent civilians, while the Nazis were killing about 14 million. Snyder finds parallels between Soviet and Nazi crimes at every turn. From my prior research, I knew that some of Snyder's accusations were false. So I spent a whole year, actually now it's closer to two years, methodically checking every single footnote, every reference to anything that could be construed as a crime by Stalin, the Soviet Union, or pro-Soviet communists, and he claims in Snyder's book. Snyder's main sources are in Polish and Ukrainian, and hard to find books and articles. So I had to study Polish and Ukrainian. I found that every single crime Snyder alleges is false, a fabrication. Snyder very often deliberately lies about what his sources say. More often, he cites anti-communist Polish and Ukrainian secondary sources that do the lying for him. Once again, not a single accusation holds up. Surprising but true. The significance of this wholesale falsification is important. For one thing, Snyder's book is now widely quoted as an authority. Snyder said it in Bloodlands, so it's established as a fact. But the broader significance of Snyder's wholesale lying and falsifying is as follows. Snyder had a team of very anti-communist, Polish and Ukrainian nationalist researchers to help him. It is their work which he is basically retailing to an English-speaking audience. Snyder himself has spent many years researching Eastern Europe between the world wars. And yet, Snyder cannot find a single genuine crime by the Soviet Union, Stalin, or even by pro-communist groups. Surely this team of dedicated anti-communists, armed with the support of their post-Soviet states, access to archives, and knowledge of all the Eastern European languages, surely they would identify some real crimes of Stalin or the Soviet Union if such existed. This constitutes the best evidence we are ever likely to have that there were no such crimes. My book on Snyder's Bloodlands, tentatively entitled Blood Lies, will be published this year in both English and Russian. Or at least I have the contract in Russian. Five, the Yezhovshina, or Great Terror, of 37-38. Since my two-part essay, Stalin and the Struggle for Democratic Reform, was written in 2004 and 2005, a great deal more evidence has been published concerning the opposition, the Moscow trials, the military purges, and the subsequent Great Terror. Actually, the Yedjosh in it, but it's often called the Great Terror after the title of the extremely dishonest book by Robert Conquest, which was first published in 1968. The newly available evidence confirms the following conclusions. Point. The defendants at the Moscow trials of August 36, 30, January 37, and March 38 were guilty of at least those crimes to which they confessed. A block of rights in Trotskyites did indeed exist. It planned to assassinate Stalin, Kaganovich, Molotov, and others in a coup d'etat, which they called a palace coup. The bloc did assassinate Kirov. Point. Both Wrights and Trotskyites were conspiring with the Germans and Japanese, as were the military conspirators. If the palace coup did not work, they hoped to come to power by showing loyalty to Germany or Japan in the event of an invasion. Point. Trotsky, too, was directly conspiring with the Germans and Japanese, as were a number of his supporters. Point. Nikolai Yezhov, head of the NKVD, internal affairs and, and the police, from late thir from 36 to late 38, was also conspiring with the Germans. A little bit more about Yezhov. We now have much more evidence about the role of NKVD chief Nikolai Yezhov than we had in 2005. Yezhov had his own conspiracy against the Soviet government party leadership. Yezhov had also been recruited by German intelligence. Like the rights of Trotskyites, Yegov and his top NKVD men were counting on an invasion by Germany, Japan, or other major capitalist countries. They tortured a great many innocent people into confessing to capitalist crimes so they could be shot. They executed a great many more on falsified grounds, or sometimes on no grounds at all. Yezhov hoped that this mass murder of innocent people would turn large parts of the Soviet population against the government. This would create the basis for internal rebellions against the Soviet government. When Germany or Japan attacked, 
Yezhab lied to Stalin, the party, and government leaders about all of this. The truly horrific mass executions of 1937 to 1938 of almost 680,000 people, or at least that's the best estimate we've got now, were in large part unjustifiable executions of innocent people carried out by, deliberately by Yezhab and his top men in order to sow discontent among the Soviet population. Although Yezhov executed a very large number of innocent people, it is clear from the evidence now available that they were also real conspiracies. The Russian government continues to keep all but a tiny amount of the investigative materials top secret. We can't know for sure exactly the dimensions of the real conspiracies without that evidence. Therefore, we don't know how many of these 680,000 people were actual conspirators and how many were innocent victims. <clears throat> As I wrote in 2005, Stalin and the party leadership began to suspect as early as October 1937 that some of the repression was being done illegally. From early in 1938, when Pavel Pastysha, a member of the Politburo, was sharply criticized, then removed from the Politburo, then removed from the Central Committee, then expelled from the party, then tried and executed for mass unjustified repressions, these suspicions grew. When Lavrenti Beria was appointed as Yezhov's second-in-command, this was in August 38, Yezhov and his men understood that Stalin and the party leadership no longer trusted them. They made one last plot to assassinate Stalin at the November 7, 1938 celebration of the 21st anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. But Yezhov's men were arrested. Yezhov was persuaded to resign. An intensive investigation was begun and a huge number of NKVD abuses were discovered. A great many cases of those tried or punished under Yezhov were reviewed. Over 100,000 people were released from prisons and camps. Many NKVD men were arrested, confessed to torturing innocent people, tried and executed. Many more NKVD men were sentenced to prison or dismissed. Under Beria, the number of executions in 1939 and 40 dropped to less than 1% of the number under Yezhov in 1937 and 38. And many of those executed were NKVD men, including Yezhov himself, found guilty of massive unjustified repression and executions of innocent people. Some of the most dramatic evidence published since, since 2005 are confessions of Yezhov and Mikhail Frenovsky Yezhov's second in command. I have put some of these on the internet. I've put all the ones that there are on the internet. There aren't any of them, as far as I know, in both the original Russian and an English translation. We also have a great many more confessions and interrogations, mostly partial, of Yezhov, in which he makes many more confessions. These were published in 2007 in a semi official account by Alexei Pavlikov. I put those on the internet too. One interesting aspect of this is that Nikolai Bukharin, Leading name among the rightists and one of its leaders knew about the Yezhov Shina as it was happening and praised it in a letter to Stalin that he wrote from prison, which has been published. It gets even better. Bukharin knew that Yezhov was a member of a rightist conspiracy, as he himself was. No doubt this is why he welcomed Yezhov's appointment as head of the NKVD, a view recorded by his widow in her memoirs. She wrote her memoirs and published in 1989. In his first confession, in his now famous letter to Stalin of December 10th, 1937, and at his trial in March 38, Bukharin claimed that he had completely disarmed and told everything he knew, but now we can prove that it, this was a lie. Bukharin knew that Yezhov was a leading member of the rightist conspiracy, but he didn't inform on it. According to Mikhail Frenovsky, Yezhov's right-hand man, Yezhov probably promised to see that he would... To, Karin that he would not be executed if he did not mention his own, Yezhov's participation. That's in Fernovsky's confession of April 11, 1939, which I have online in both languages. If Bukharin had told the truth, if he had in fact informed on Yezhov, Yezhov's mass murders could have been stopped in their tracks. The lives of hundreds of thousands of innocent people could have been saved. But Bukharin remained true to his fellow conspirators. He went to execution, an execution he swore in his and his appeal he deserved ten times over without revealing Yezhov's participation in the conspiracy. This point cannot be stressed too much. The blood of the hundreds of thousands of innocent persons slaughtered by Yezhov and his men during 37-38 are in Bukharin's hand. Objectivity and evidence. I agree with historian Jeffrey Roberts when he says, quote, In the last 15 years or so, an enormous amount of new material on Stalin has become available from Russian archives. I should make it clear that as a historian, I have a strong orientation to telling the truth about the past, no matter how uncomfortable or unpalatable the conclusions may be. I do not think that there is a dilemma. You just tell the truth as you see it. End quote. The conclusions I have re reached about the Yezhov Shina will be unacceptable to ideologically motivated people. I have not reached these conclusions out of any desire to apologize for the policies of Stalin or the Soviet government. I believe these conclusions to be the only objective ones 
possible based upon the available evidence. I make no claim that the Soviet Union leadership was free from error. Stalin's vision of a socialism leading to communism was obviously faulty in that it did not come to pass. During Stalin's time, as during the short period of Lenin's leadership, the Soviets made a great many errors. Error is, of course, inevitable in all human endeavor. And since the Bolsheviks were the first communists to conquer and hold state power, they were in unknown waters. It was inevitable, therefore, that they would make a great many mistakes, and they did. Six, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of August 1939. At a conference some years back, it was in fact the MLG in uh, Milwaukee, yeah, I think so. a liberal anti-communist threw the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, often called by anti-communists the Hitler face. You that guy? Mm -hmm. yeah. How can I defend it? He virtually shouted at me. I realized I did not know nearly as much about it as I should, so I spent the summer of 2009 researching it. The result is a monograph-sized article entitled, quote, this is the title, not a very sexy title, <laughs> did the Soviet Union invade Poland in September 1939? The answer, no, it did not, end quote. You can read it with 17 web pages of evidence and documentation on my homepage. I learned a lot. For one thing, I learned that the pact was not an alliance. It's always called an alliance, but it wasn't an alliance. I learned the Soviet Union didn't invade Poland in 1939, and that all the Allies agreed at the time that it didn't. I learned that the Soviet Union was the only country that acted properly in the pre-war period. It's the only conclusion I could honestly reach. Seven, the Katyn Massacre. In April 1943, Nazi Germany authorities claimed that they had discovered thousands of bodies of Polish officers shot by Soviet officials in 1940 near the Katyn Forest near Smolensk in western Russia. The Nazi propaganda machine organized a huge campaign around this alleged discovery. After the Soviet victory at Stalingrad in February 1943, it was obvious to everyone that, unless something happened to split the Allies, Germany would inevitably lose the war. The Nazis' obvious aim was to drive a wedge between the Western Allies and the Soviet Union. The Soviet government, headed by Joseph Stalin, vigorously denied the German charge. When the Polish government in exile, always ferociously anti-communist and anti-Russian, Collaborated with the Nazi propaganda effort, the Soviet government broke diplomatic relations with it. During the Cold War, the rest of Western capitalist countries supported the Nazi version, now promoted by the anti-communist Poles. The Soviet Union and its allies continued to blame the Germans until in 1990 to 1992. Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin stated that the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin had indeed shot the Poles. Fast forward. At the beginning of 2013, a year ago, I learned about archaeological findings at a German mass murder site in Ukraine. As I have been following the dispute over the Katyn massacre for many years, I soon recognized the implications of these findings. They provide material evidence that the Soviet Union could not have shot the 14,800 or 22,000 or whatever number of Polish officers who were POWs in 1940. My article, The Official Version of the Katyn Massacre Disproven, is in the July 2013 issue of Socialism and Democracy. I have brought some copies for those of you who are interested. They cost me $3 a piece. The discoveries in the mass graves at Volodymyr Volinsky, Ukraine, constitute a lethal blow to the official version of the Katyn Massacre. This is something that should interest us all. Katyn has been the most famous crime alleged against Stalin and the Soviet government. It has hitherto also been the crime most firmly grounded in documentary evidence. For example, it is unlike the alleged Holodomor, the supposed deliberate starvation by Stalin of millions of Ukrainians in the famine of 32-33, for which no evidence has ever been found. And I'm going to say something about that at the end. <laughs> Katyn is the keystone of contemporary right-wing Polish nationalism. Katyn is also a key component of anti-Stalin, anti-Soviet, and anti-communist propaganda in general. Until now, it has been the best known such alleged atrocity and by far the best documented one. Katyn has been the best proven crime of Stalinism, and it's a lie. Eight, Trotsky in the 1930s. Long before Khrushchev, Leon Trotsky was portraying Stalin as a bloodthirsty mass killer and the Moscow trials of the 1930s as fabrications. Trotsky was the first to use, to, uh, use the term totalitarian to apply to both the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany to yoke them together. Few people believed it until the 1950s. Then two things happened in the 50s. One was Khrushchev's secret speech. The second was Isaac Deutscher's three-volume biography, especially the last volume, The Prophet Outcast, which actually came out in 62. On January 2, 1980, the Trotsky archives at Harvard were opened. 
During the 1980s and 90s, American historian Arch Getty and Pierre Brouet at the time, the most foremost Trotskyist researcher in the world, discovered evidence that Trotsky had deliberately lied about his contacts with the Soviet oppositionists. But Brouet never explored the implications of what he discovered. I have been studying all this. I mean, anybody could. It's out there. It will startle, even disturb many, to know, learn that it was not Stalin, but Trotsky, who lied in his post-1934 writings. And he lied about pretty much everything having to do with the Soviet Union and Stalin. It was Trotsky who invented false stories about the Moscow trials during the 1930s. Trotsky lied in the Bulletin of the Opposition, that's his journal, to his followers. He lied big time to the Dewey Commission in 1937. All Trotsky biographers, both the sympathetic and the hostile, simply ignore all of this. I read them all, believe me, you don't want to do that, but I did it. Uh, it is symptomatic of the impasse in which most of the left finds itself today that the Trotskyists have ignored the evidence available for over 20 years now that Trotsky's writings about Stalin and the Soviet Union during the 30s are deliberate falsehoods. This was discovered by Pierre Brouet back in the 1980s, and he was a Trotskyist scholar, but they ignore it. I'm currently writing a book on Trotsky during the 1930s. It should be published next year, 2015. Conclusion. In my view, the importance of all this new evidence and research lies mainly in proving the utter dishonesty of the mainstream accounts of Soviet history, accounts that pass for the truth, not only among Cold War anti-communists, not only among Trotskyists, but also uh, are the mainstream views on the left. To paraphrase the immortal words of Weird Al Yankovic, everything you think you know about the history of the Soviet Union during the Stalin years is wrong. Stuff. Yeah, Yankovic wrote a spot called Everything You Know Is Wrong, you know, up is down, black is white, and short is long. Well, that's the case. <laughs> we Marxists ought to be relieved. All around the world, the horror stories about Stalin and the Stalin period are employed to discredit Marxism, socialism, and communism. Now we can see these horror stories are lies. The communist movements of the 20th century did not lead to communism. Instead, they led back to capitalism. Obviously, they made serious errors, but these were the errors not of criminals and murderers, as we are incessantly told, but of pioneers. The Bolsheviks were blazing an unmarked trail, going where no man had gone before. In this sense, then, these were not even errors, but part of the process of learning how to build communism. Mankind learns by trial and error. But we who come after them must carefully study what they did. We will never discover what those errors were, or what the Bolsheviks did that was right, correct, admirable, and worthy of imitation, unless we know what really did happen. A new and better communist movement cannot be built, can only be built upon a sound foundation of historical truth, not upon the sand of anti-communist lies. I am glad to be paying, playing a small part in the effort to undercover this true history. My new book on the cure of murder and how its solution not only exposes anti-communist lies, but shows that the Moscow trials were honest, the conspiracies legend in the real is on sale here for $20. I've also brought some copies of my 2011 book, Khrushchev Lied, in which I expose in detail the lies and falsehoods in Khrushchev's infamous secret speech. I've also brought some copies of the article in which I show the Captain Massacre story has been disproved. They cost me $3 a piece to print. I hope you'll give me $3 for a copy. If you can't, however, let me know and I'll give you one for free. It's worth studying, not only for the results, but also just to see how they do it. How false anti-communist Anti-Stalin, anti-Soviet stories get built up, get constructed, and, and built up to the point whereby they are almost universally accepted and virtually never questioned. Thank you. I have, couple, I have some favors for you. I have a couple of things to hand out to you. Uh, if you please pass these out. This, this first set of handouts, I hope I have enough, uh, is our, these are web pages illustrating the eight yeah, maybe you just hand on that. web pages for the research that I referred to, the eight points that I discussed in my in my talk. Okay, I've written about this material and these are web pages where you can go and read further, read further, read the research on it if, if you're interested to do that. Now, concerning my books, I have something else too. Thank you for handing that around. That's great. I got more stuff for you to hand out. I have a letter here, and I'm going to tell you what it's all about. Here, could you hand this? 
Now it's not handy. Thanks. I'm handy, passing out. Joe and this other gentleman here are passing out. Well, oh, they've got it. First row's got it. Uh, this is a letter in which I urge you to go to your library, public, university, college, any library, and try to get your library to, to uh, acquire these books and put them in their collection. And the reason is, as I explain in this letter, letter. that it's, it's actually more important, or it, it's important in a different way to get these books into libraries than it is for you all and others to buy them individually. I sell a thousand copies of these, book, of these books, and they all sit on some individual's bookshelf. Well, then those thousand people have read it, hopefully, and they know something. But it basically doesn't exist for the rest of the world. Students and workers and people interested in Soviet history will not have access to them. They will only have access to them if this gets into libraries. That's the case. So, um, I then have these uh, flyers, and Joe, don't, don't, don't give up yet. I've got some more flyers for you to hand out. I've, I've got through those two if anybody didn't get yeah. I've got our flyers, one flyer for, for each of these books. One's in the Khrushchev book and one's in the, for the uh, uh, Kirov book. And the flyers each have the information that any acquisitions librarian will need. They have the ISBN number, they have the web page at Amazon and the publisher, and they have the OCLC number. The OCLC number is the number for that's used by this great mega database of world libraries. Okay? And when a, when a, when a li book is acquired, the acquiring library, librarian has to, a uh, cataloger has to look and see if it's on OCLC. And if it isn't, they have to go through a, a complicated uh, rigmarole of entering it in OCLC, but but these books are already in OCLC, so they can just type in this number and check. They know how to do that. So this is the information they need. Now let me just say, uh, and here, could you hand this one out? This is a good chip line. Um, it isn't going to work probably if you mail it in or call them up. It's going to work. If at, if at all, if you go in in person and ask to speak to the acquisitions librarian and leave this material, not the letter, but the brochure, the leaflet with them. Now, they still may not acquire it, but they certainly aren't going to acquire it if you don't ask them. Because these, this is by a small left-wing press. This is not going to be in any of the library journals. It's not going to be advertised in any of the big magazines. The scholars in the field aren't going to mention it. It was reviewed in Socialism and Democracy, and that's great. But, uh, you know, uh, if we're going to get into libraries, individuals have to go and request it. And a number of people have done that. So it is in some libraries, and it needs to get into libraries. So that's like a political, politically important thing to do. Not for me. Uh, not for me. But this is if we want the truth to get out there and to be available to people, that's what we need to do, right? We need to get that out. Yeah. Now, uh, the way I envisage things going now on, if that's okay with you, is to have some Q&A and a little discussion. But I thought I would start out by just saying a word or two about the Ukrainian business. I'm not going to talk about the politics of it. We can discuss that if you want to. Uh, and I'm sure we have, you know, broadly similar views. But the, um, the there are a number of myths that underpin right-wing Polish nationalism, which predominates in Poland. And there are a couple of myths that underpin right-wing Ukrainian nationalism, which is heavily, heavily in evidence these days in uh, Kiev, all right, and, and is uh, a major reason why a lot of Russian speakers in eastern Ukraine are thinking about seceding if they thought. Um, and that, these are the myths. Number one, the two myths are the myth that Stalin and company deliberately starved millions of Ukrainian peasants, uh, either in order to take all their grain to spend on something else, or in order to punish them for their patriotic nationalistic feelings, or for whatever reason. That's called the Holodomor myth. Holodomor is a, is a nonce word co coined in the 19... Well, sometime, or at least popularized in the 1980s by the, the Ukrainian, right-wing Ukrainian uh, diaspora people outside of Ukraine have been imported into Ukraine. Ukrainian scholars from Ukraine didn't know about it until it was imported. Uh, 
And uh, and secondly is the myth about the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army, the uh, the uh, organization of Ukrainian nationalists who fought on the side of the Nazis in World War II. They were they, they were patriots. They were nationalists. So nationalism justifies everything, right? Of course, Hitler was a nationalist, right? When the uh, defendants who were executed after the Nuremberg trials went to their executions, they almost all of them said, you know, I did it all for Germany. I did it all for Germany. Right? So nationalism, they think nationalism excuses what they did. But that's the second part. But let me just say a word or two about the, about the, uh, a lot of more business. I'm writing a book on, to refute, as I mentioned, the uh, refute uh, Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, and, and a big part of his book is his acceptance of the deliberate starvation uh, story. And, of course, it kind of has to do that, because if you're going to equate or even, you know, even bring the Soviet, equate the Soviet Union with Nazi Germany, or even bring it close to Nazi Germany, you have to come up with millions of victims, right? Because you need millions of victims. So well, the only place to get millions of victims is in this famine. So therefore, that's where the millions of victims are going to come from. Therefore, it's very important ideologically that Stalin had you know, deliberately killed all these people. Well, there are some good research. There is some good research about this. It's not all that easy to find, but. Uh, in, I'm writing a narrative to go in, in before my analysis in front of the chapter in which I analyze um, Snyder's research and show how false it is. And it's I'm using the writing of the research of a guy named Mark Talger, who's a professor at the University of uh, West Virginia University, who's a straight arrow as you could ever meet. He's not a leftist of any kind. Uh, he's a so there's certainly no lover of Stalin or communism or anything like that. But he's one of these historians who was taught in graduate school that you're supposed to find out the truth and look at the evidence and tell it like it is, and that's what he does. And his research shows that not only was this this famine not deliberately caused, but that the Soviet government, through collectivization and also through providing aid, uh, saved, you know, successfully organized the population and saved uh many, many, many people from dying in this famine, and then he goes on to, to say that collectivization, far from being some sort of abuse of the peasants, was actually a real reform that stopped future famines. And, you know, if this was coming from a leftist, it would be very, you know, many people would be suspicious of it. But his research is, he's right out there, his research uh, it shows this, and he's uh, not afraid to publish it and is uh, disgusted that, uh, that others don't you know, uh, for political reasons, uh, uh, try to shade the truth or even just lie directly about it. In fact, he told me some time ago he'd gotten a letter from a high school student in Ukraine who reads English. And she said, well, we have to do a paper on the, a lot of more on the famine. This is taught compulsorily to everybody in Ukraine. And, uh, you know, I know your, I, I see your stuff, uh, your articles, and could you help me? Could you send me some things to read? And he did. She read it this material. She wrote her paper, and she wrote him back and said, my teacher failed me. <laughs> failed me. He, he said this to me. He said, he failed me. She said, he said, my teacher told me you can't use Mark Tauber's work. He's a communist Jew. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, Tauber is not a communist by any stretch of the imagination, but he is Jewish somewhere or other, you know. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff that's going on, you know. This, 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 this construction of, uh, of these horror stories and lies, and, and uh, so I'm, my next book is, is, is goes into uh, disproving that and other falsehoods uh, that are in Timothy Snyder's book, and that'll be out sometime later this year, right, George? It'll be out, should be out in the next three or four months, and uh, we'll all get to know about that. Uh, so, okay, maybe we can have some, I guess it's uh, questions and answers or remarks or whatever. First, I have a question just space wise. When people like another window open, it's kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So I'm going to do that while people are taking this. Okay, so this one's up as far as we go. Just watch out there, so. No QA? Um, yep, yes, sir. Um, regarding uh, the Ukraine situation, yep. a lot of left communists, anarchists, and such will say that um, the Bolsheviks betrayed the revolution when they made Ukraine territory. When they what? When, when, uh, when was this? In the, in the 20s, I believe. It was uh, the uh, 
There was a Ukrainian Rada which came along. Uh, I mean, there were Ukrainian nationalists in Western Europe, uh, uh, and the Ukrainian Rada which came along with the Germans when the Germans, after during, as part of the Civil War, invaded part of the Ukraine, and they set themselves up as a Ukrainian government, but they were a, <coughs> completely formed by, you know, as, as a result of the, the the German army when the Germans withdrew the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian Rada fled. The Ukrainian nationalists, or some Ukrainian nationalists anyway, now claim that that was the first independent government of Ukraine. And the second one was the one declared by Stepan Bandera and, and uh, uh, Yaroslav Stetsko and all of these Nazi mass murderers who came in with with the Germans, with the Nazis in World War II. And they had their contradictions with the Germans. I mean, Hitler decided that he didn't want to give them as long a leash as they wanted, right? So he put some of them in a concentration camp, but he let them all out again, too. So um, And they were involved in Lots of mass murders. In fact, uh, I quote some research done by anti-nationalist, but still bourgeois, not leftist, Ukrainian scholars in this article on the Katyn issue. These bodies that were a Polish, off, including those bodies of Polish officers that were supposed to have been killed 700 miles away by the Soviets in, in April, May 1940, and turned out really were killed in late 1941 in Volodymyr Volensky, Ukraine, were actually shot not just by the Nazis, but also by their Ukrainian nationalist allies uh, who came in with them. And they, these Ukrainian, not leftists at all, but anti-nationalist Ukrainian scholars uh, have written about that. So I found that material and put in references to that stuff too. So um, the, the, like the like Polish nationalism, and I'm, this probably goes for other Eastern European countries too, the construction of Ukrainian nationalism is very right wing. It makes heroes out of these fascist mass murderers. And uh, there's an article in today's New York Times where somebody, you know, the reporter, is, uh, interviews this uh, professor, Andreas Umland, who is of German background. I get his newsletter. He's an anti-communist guy. He teaches at in, in, a, in a Ukrainian university, they asked him about Bandera, and he said, oh, Bandera, you know, some say he was a nationalist, and some say he was a fascist, and there's no agreement about that, what a coward, you know. Of course he was a fascist. You know, it, it, he's implicated in lots of mass murders, and these anti-Ukrainian scholars and many others um, write about that. There's a biography that's supposed to appear within the next year. Uh, finally, a scholarly biography, in English, by the way, of, uh, of Stepan Bandera. And the guy who's writing is a guy named Grigory Ruck. Ruck. Grigory Rakosowski Liva had been giving talks. Well, he's given a couple of talks in Ukraine about the Germans. And I was told by somebody who's a friend of his that he had had bodyguards. The Ukrainian right wing was going to attack his talks because he's attacking their you know, their hero. And uh, there are streets named after him in Western Ukraine and statues to him. And then in Eastern Ukraine, there are, there are monuments to the victims of the Ukrainian nationalists. So this this is a big split. Ukraine is very seriously split. We can see that kind of thing going on now. Yes, ma'am, you had a hand up. Okay. Well, we'll do the generation. Um, uh, I remember when I was living with Cousins, both had been in the party, uh, and I was and still am. Um, remember when Stalin died, Bill said, you know, he did a few stupid things, but you know, on the whole, he was a great guy, and I always respected him, which taught me how to be a good mother, too, by the way. But um, with that, when I was in school, I had a history professor who was very close to some really big ones in the State Department. And uh, this is what we were taught for 20th century history, was that Stalin screwed up because he believed junk, which was coming through from German um, intelligence coming through, and that uh, he messed up on some of his great generals during the whole trial piece, you know. Yes. That, you know, like I said, that's coming from <laughs> yes. the right wing State Department. Sure. Which sort of gives sort of a thing. The other thing is I wanted to say on the Ukraine, um, 
when I was in high school, um, uh, we were recommended, so I did read, if you wanted to know what went on in, um, in the Soviet Union uh, in the 20s and 30s, uh, to read Sholokov's Quiet Praise of God, and then God comes home to the sea, and you see the conflicts and uh, the uh, stuff coming in from abroad, mm -hmm. and the internal conflicts and what happens, so that you have know, a sort of skepticism. And then you can read Nicholas's book here, uh, um, Love and War, Volumes 2 and 3 coming out, but uh, who uh, was born in this country, who's that? Nicholas Burlak. <laughs> well, you may be in trouble. I'll show you after sure. uh, but uh, volume two or three. Uh, he, um, his, his father, his family, his father left um, in 1905 to escape with his life. And uh, in the early 30s, Nick was born here. Half the family was here, and half went back with his mm -hmm. father. And um, that was because there was no work for miners. <laughs> and so um, during the war, um, 1941, Nick was 16. And uh, so Nick was sent to Siberia by father to a brother who, uh, because there was a lot of anti-foreign mm -hmm. stuff going on in the 30s. And that family was split, but they were so Nick went to uh, Siberia. At any rate, uh, when he turned 18, he tried to enlist, and he was being rejected because he was married. Mm -hmm. At any rate, he did, and then um, uh, six months later, he was in the Battle of Kursk, and uh, got wounded promptly. But then rejoined, and he went to Berlin, and part of his initials in the Reichstag. For him. <laughs> Let me just say something about the. But, the, but I'm saying the split, and yeah. I know personal stories of mm -hmm. other yeah. people, um, you know, the one who was sent to camp, you know, a real tragedy, came back and um, became a very honored uh, artist. Sure. You know, that way. So there's a lot of, uh, I'll say, mis <laughs> mistakes were made. Sure. And uh, it has, uh, particularly, I think, at anything, um, when uh, this goes for a lot of movements, you you have to be careful to look at your facts and judge individuals for sure. and not yeah, and, the current. Yeah, and what happened in 37, 38 is Jezhov was just arresting people left and right. This is one of the things I touched on. <laughs> now, let me just say something about the, uh, general, the generals. Um, after World War II, Three former SD men, as in people who were in the Sicherheitsdienst, uh, which was the uh, uh, the German uh, intelligence, wrote books. They contradict each other, all claiming that they helped the German intelligence frame Marshal Dukhachevsky, planted false information, and so forth and so on. And uh, this story got around. Not everybody accepted it. This story got around so much that when Khrushchev came around, he actually had his men look into it. They said, no, there's nothing to there's nothing that. Back. I, a long time ago, I, back in 10 years ago or so, I, I, I wrote most of a book about the Khrushchevsky affair, and then I put it aside for a while. Uh, but uh, I, I did thorough research on all of that stuff. That's all nonsense. That didn't happen. The Germans... Not with him, maybe, but uh, there were... Well, if you say suspicion came on the number of people who shouldn't have, well, could be. and that uh, their losses were felt at the initial. Uh, I, 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 well, I, okay. I mean, I'm not saying I can't. I've looked into the Tukhachevsky business yeah. quite a bit, and I have a draft of the manuscript, which one of these years I'm going to wrap up re redoing and bringing up to date. There's a tremendous amount of evidence that that the major, those primary generals were guilty, uh, but but. But that doesn't mean that everybody who was executed was guilty. Sure, I, 